This conference will now be recorded. Okay, hello everybody. It's the uh, 7th of November. Um, this is Rick Davis and I'm in the um, moderator seat this week for the first Monday of the month. Doesn't seem like it, but last Monday was Halloween. And so we did a bit of a trick or treat. If you uh, showed up, you got tricked. But if you came back this week, you got treated. Um, so um, let's see. I have to thank um, right now just Bayer and Pfizer. Pfizer. That's <laughs> Bob. Um, I have to thank Bayer and Pfizer, but we have a few more names we're going to be adding to that. So it, the moderators are going to have to uh, be alert pretty soon when we announce who these new names are, and that's a good thing for us. Um, I don't see any new names, um, but um, I will go down the list. And if I'm mistaken, we'll promote them. Um, so let me start. Let me start with the East Coast Traveler and member of our Brains Trust, Len. Anything for you, Len? Niente for Atello. Niente. Okay. Um, Mike Yancey, how about you? I have a good night. Thanks. Nothing. Was that a, was that a no? No. No. Okay. No. Yeah. Got it. No. Got it. Ben, anything for you today? I think tonight. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Richard Craymond, how about you? Nothing tonight. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mark Valens, anything you have? Well, thank you, Rick. I'm doing great. Great, we love, we like to hear that. Um, Peter Kafka back in Maui, anything for you? No, not this week, not, nothing tonight. Okay, uh, Bob Snyder, anything for you? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what I'm going through right now. Okay, we'll be back to you. Tony Fig, anything for you? Oh, I'm all set, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Norm Pollock, anything for you? Yeah, I got a little update. Okay. Uh, Dr. Jack, anything for you? Yes, I, I, I appreciate some time. Okay. Jim Marshall, anything for you, Captain? Negative. Okay. Larry Fish, we remembered. Anything for you? Uh, no, thank you. Okay. Jimmy G. Uh, I'd like to share some recipes. No, no, no nothing really. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dr. Bob, anything for you? No, I'm good tonight. Good. George Rovda. Uh, thank you, Rick. Just a thanks to all the moderators and nothing to add. Thank you. Sylvester, anything for you, sir? No, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Les, anything for you? Not tonight, thanks. Okay. Uh, Jeff Wood. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Rick. Okay. Uh, James Davidson, anything for you? Uh, no, thank you, sir. I am good tonight. Okay. Uh, Joe Gallo, Captain Joe, anything for you? No, I'm fine tonight. Thanks. Uh, Rob in Colorado, anything for you? Not tonight, but thanks. Okay. Uh, Dennis McGuire, you, I think you have something. Yeah, hi, Rick. Yes, I do. Okay. Joe Blanchett, anything for you? No, not tonight. Just last week. Okay. Stan Friedman. No, thanks, Rick. Holding my own. Good, good. Um, Russ Hoover. Nothing tonight, thanks. Uh, David Muslin. Nothing tonight, Rick. Thank you. Okay, Gary Peters. No, thanks, Rick. Oh, Frida. Nothing for me. Thanks. Okay. Um, 
Paul, we 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 had a discussion about your medonk last week, and the general conclusion was that he is uh, very well qualified. We talked about Dr. Schwarzenberg. Um, okay, Rich Jackson, anything for you? Not tonight, thank you. Okay, and I think I saw Mike win there. Anything that you wanted to raise, Mike? Nothing, sir. Thank you. Okay. Um, did I get everybody? Or did I miss anybody? That's a better way to say it. Anybody I didn't call on? <clears throat> okay. Oh, I see Jim Marshall has switched it to Jim Marshall Melbourne. Are you in Florida, Mr. Marshall? Captain Marshall? Yes, I am for a month. Only All a month. Right. And then I leave because there's too many old people down here. <laughs> Le Le Len, want to comment on that? He's on the other coast, though. You're, you're OK. Well, uh, I'm afraid he's right. <laughs> I, Jim Marshall, we'll have to, we're, we're going to uh, introduce you to Gary Tosco, who lives in Melbourne, who's one of our active surveillance moderators. Yes, um, please. I will. We'll t I'll take care of it. I, I'm, I'm writing it down right now. Marshall and Tosca. Okay. He's also a vet. So you'll like you'll like this. It's a good that's a, that's a good match. All right. Um, so let's um, start. We don't have anybody new, and based on Len's experience, I know who was it last week. I think it was Dr. John last week yes. who um, whisked through everybody so quickly. I think we'll have plenty of time tonight. Oh, and that just. Just a reminder, Len, that because of this screwy month, you are going to be moderating next Tuesday. Yes, I okay. noticed that. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Let's start with Bob Snyder. And Bob, you want to give us a little update for the guys um, so they know what's going on with you and then tell us what's on your mind. Well, they, they tell me I'm starting to run out of options. And uh, but they finally got the Pluvicto in Rochester, New York, where I live. But uh, in the meantime, they put me on uh, my PSA was up at 80 and they put me on Extandy for a while. And that worked for a couple of months. It brought my PSA down to 10 and then it started rising again. And right now it's around 22. And I just got another PSMA scan. And uh, I've had one before. They, uh, that's another reason why they put it off, because they said I didn't have much PSMA sh showing up in the scan. So they didn't know how well it was going to work. But uh, they said they're going to try it anyway now and see if it, how good it does for me. So uh, that's that's where I stand. Okay. Well, a couple of things. Did they do did they do a regular CT scan? Uh, yeah, I've had it. Well, I think I think it was. I've had I've had all kinds of scans. I had okay. an MRI. I had an NMO. Let, 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 let me let me rephrase that. Did they do a CT scan at the same time as doing the PSMA scan? Um, not this time, but, um, okay. yeah, about, so, uh, uh, what, what they need to do before you start putting yourself through the pilarify, you've got to talk to your doctor about doing a full CT scan, not the CT scan that they do just to locate the lesions, but you need a CT scan alongside your PSMA scan. Because if you have a lot of lesions that are not expressing PSMA, then pilarify is not the right treatment for you. 
that that has been acknowledged in clinical research so just to put you through this very expensive treatment when you have a whole bunch of um scans that are not avid what they call avid meaning they don't express psma is not a good decision choice okay just because it's out there doesn't mean it's the right treatment yeah. who are you um i have a note here that um you're seeing a doctor called um, Dr. Adrian Victor, she's yes. the medical oncologist. Yes. Um, and, you know, I think we suggested that you move your treatment to Dr. Van Veltheisen. If, doc, if Dr. Victor has not done a comparative CT scan and she is recommending that you do the pilarify, you have to go back to her and say, well, why am I doing pilarify if I've got all these scans, if I've got lesions that don't express? If she says, we don't know if they express or not, you say, well, you've got to do a concurrent scan because what we're doing with the CT scan is we're looking to see where we can see certain lesions. May not be all of them, but we can see that there are lesions. Then we do a PSMA scan because that looks for prostate cancer lesions and we compare the two because we want to make sure that all the lesions in your body that we see are expressing PSMA because if they're not, we'll kill, let's say, 80% of the lesions, but there still leaves 20% that we didn't get to. And then they just start all over again. A am I making sense to you? Yeah. I guess they're thinking I don't have any options left. So well, you do have options. You have plenty of options. You well, know, I mean, I shouldn't say plenty, but you, you, you do have, um, you do have other options. I mean, you haven't, I don't think you've done, oh, yes, you did. You did cabazitaxel. Um, yep. I mean, one option that you want to, you might want to talk to them about, uh, that we will talk about again a little later, is this BAT, the bipolar androgen therapy, which can work. Um, it's not that durable, gives you eight to 12 months. But who knows what comes down the pike during that period of time? Anyway, I've said enough. Why don't I I let some of the other guys um, well, talk I'll to I'll ask you about that bipolar androgen too. I haven't heard of that before. Okay. Anybody want to jump in and well, uh, Rick, I think we need to clarify here. All PSMA <clears throat> PET scans are performed concurrently with CT, but it's a low resolution CT right. to help with uh, anatomical resolution. I think what you meant was he, he should have a, a separate. No, uh, I said CT. that then. Oh, you did? I okay, said that. sorry. I said, I said to him that the CT scan they did is just to locate the lesions for him, but he needs a full CT scan. Right, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's confusing because they, they always do a CT scan but the, with the PSMA, but, the, but they do a CT scan just so that they can locate the position of the lesions on your body. It, it, it isn't, as Len says, a high enough resolution that they can identify um, lesions with that. They're just doing it to position the body, to position you um, so they know what part of the body they're seeing the lesions because the PSMA just lights up, but it doesn't tell you where exactly that lesion is. So you're saying a second CT scan at full resolution? 
I'm saying a second CT scan at full resolution, which is what is recommended by the trials, that if you're getting a PSMA scan, you also get a, um, a uh, second scan for, I always get the word wrong, congruence. Is that the right word, guys? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, I was going to say that. Go ahead. That's the technical word you've got to, you can use with Dr. A, Dr. Victor, that you want to make sure that there is congruence. Go ahead, Norm. Oh, that, that CT that they do with the, with the PET CT is just an anatomical scan. So if you're referring right. to it like that, it's just, it just shows the body. It doesn't really. That's right. Happen. Right. So, you know, there's been, um, there's been, and maybe somebody can put a, the reference in the chat window for you. There's been a bunch of literature recently about the bipolar androgen therapy. We've had some guys that have done it. Um, they've done well on it, um, but we know it isn't durable. Um, we've had guys doing bipolar androgen therapy in this group for over five years, wow. but it may, it, it, it may well um be helpful and most guys do feel very good on it okay. any um i got a meeting with my oncologist on uh wednesday so i'll i'll ask about the yeah ask, and you know but if you are congruent if you are congruent and you've established your congruent, Pilarify is, is a great way to go. Rick, no. uh, Rick I, it's actually con concordance. Concordance. Is it concordance? I always get, I get yeah. That's why I say I get them confused. Concurrent. I know, concordant, I do too. Congruent, concordant. Yeah. Changed congruent to concordant. I got the wrong wrong word you've got to be concordant which no. which means from concord which means agreement which means that the lesions that they see agree with the psma lesions that they're together <clears throat> thanks for the correction then Anybody have any other ideas they want to throw out for, for Bob to discuss with Dr. Victor? Explain that Polarify again. What is that? The, that's the PSMA. Who wants to, who, who would like to take a shot at that one for Bob? Ben. Yeah. The, the Polarify scan is the, uh, well, the full name is 18F DCF PYL, but uh, it's, it's an imaging agent. It's, it's not a therapeutic agent. Oh, and, and I misspoke, Len. I, I should have said Pluvicto and I said Polarify. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to have yeah. confused Pl you. Pluvicto is the therapeutic, yeah. Yeah. I should have said Pluvicto. I should have, what I should have said to you is the Pluvicto is a great treatment for you if you're concordant. I got it right that time. The Pluvicto is a great treatment for you if you're concordant. Right. Yeah, they keep, they keep saying I don't have much PSMA, so they don't know how it's going to work. Well, maybe then they need to look at something different because if you don't have a lot of PSMA, if it works for the lesions, but it leaves a lot more lesions, then that's an awful lot of time and energy and money that you're using. If you're not, if you don't have that concordance, that's what you've got to get into. Okay.
Taking a step back, Rick, the, so the concordance is that the CT scan shows the same lesions as the PSMA scan. I'm sorry, Jeff, just repeat that because I just lost I just lost a connection for a split just second. Taking a, taking a step back, so this when you say concordance, it's a concordance between the CT scan showing the same lesions as the PSMA scan, correct? Exactly, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And, and, and what happened is that in Australia, when they did the testing, um, concordance was one of the eligibility factors. But if I'm not mistaken, and the Brains Trust can correct me here, it, it, it was not a, it wasn't part of the trials here, but then I think at some point they changed the trials because they realized that that um, they had to make sure people were concordant in order to get a true result of the impact of the pilarify. Does that sound does that sound right to Ben and Len and Dr. John? Yeah. Well, the original vision trial in the U.S., which led to the approval of Pluvicto, uh, did not have any concordant uh, scans. Uh, they did. They did it in Australia with a trial called Therapy. They used FDG as the concordant uh, scan. Now, uh, you, Rick, you said at some later stage, maybe at another trial, they used uh, a concordant scan. I, I wasn't aware of that, but I wouldn't be surprised. I could be wrong too. I'm not sure, but I, I thought they did innovate it because. Certainly, the the principal investigators of the trial here were recommending that you were recommending that you did get um, the CT scan, the full CT scan, and the and the PSMA scan. Yeah, because anyway, in, the, in the Australian trial. 49% of the trial participants uh, responded with a PSA 50 decline, but in the US where they didn't use a concordant scan, the response rate was only 29%. So that shows you the benefit of using that concordant scan. Right, 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 right. And, and, I, and I think this is a really good segue to, to move to Dennis McGuire. Um, Dennis, why, why don't you update us? And, you know, we can keep talking about these same, these yeah, same issues sure. a little bit. Um, so last week I had a PSMA PET scan, uh, which was about 11 weeks after my last Fluvicto treatment. So I did six cycles of Pluvicto. 11 weeks later, did a PSMA PET scan. Um, the results of the PET scan, some good news, some bad news. Um, the good news is the pretreatment lesions in the lymph nodes um, were reduced. Uh, and I quote from the report, those lymph nodes in the abdomen and pelvis were significantly decreased in size with no significant uptake. So the bad news is that there were some new spots on the bone um, that were not seen in the pretreatment scans. Um, so I think what they, what the technician or radiologist believes is that these new spots could be treatment resistant. So, you know, having gone through the six treatments of Pluvicto, um, those PSMA spots are, are still there. 
Um, yeah, so that, that's the big picture overview. Um, Dennis, were you, did they do the concordance exercise before they started you off? Yeah, in December we did that and it was concordant. So the, it would suggest that these are new lesions um, that, um, that are not PSMA avid. Uh, no, they, they show up on the PSMA scan, right? So they are PSMA avid. That, that's what's puzzling about this. Oh, right. Right? So they show up on the PSMA scan, but they, they seem to have survived the Plavicto treatment. And they were definitely there before. No, well, that, that, see it, they pre, the, the pre-treatment PET scan, they did not show up. Okay. So that that's what still is kind of puzzling to me. Uh, over the course of eleven months, you could have spots show up. Um, now, because they're bone lesions, they don't give an estimate of size. Right. Which uh, which was kind of new to me because I've my previous lesions have been lymph nodes. And they always give some estimate of size, so you could kind of measure. Um, so I guess you have to rely upon the SUV, the uptake. So, so here's a thought. <clears throat> here's a thought that maybe you can drill down with when you speak to. Um, to Dr. Morris tomorrow, right? You're speaking to Dr. Morris tomorrow? Yes. Yep. Um, you, you've taken a while to respond. Certainly in that the very first one you did, you took a while to respond to the PSMA. I can't remember how quickly you responded in the Chicago. But if these if if these new lesions arrive during your treatment yep. and they're PSMA avid, maybe they arrive too late and they, they needed six doses to respond and they didn't get six doses. They may have gotten two doses or three doses. And, and I would ask, so I would ask Dr. Morris, you know, has he seen this before? And is it possible that they might not, because we don't know when they arrived because you didn't have the PSMA right. scan during the treatment, right? That's right, no scan. So it was, yeah, it was basically 11 months. So let's just say they first showed up six months ago. And so instead of getting six treatments, they only got three treatments. But we, you have a history of not responding to three treatments. Yeah, it's possible. Um, it's possible, but I guess I, I, the question I have is why, while you're getting the infusions of Pluvicto, how a, a PSMA cancer could grow. You know what um, I'm saying? Yeah, no, I think it's a really good. Unless like, want... like, the, like the radiologist said in his, his first paragraph, his his hypothesis is that those lesions could be resistant to or flavicta. 
something I mean, about I do, it now. I now, do the good, think now, could... building on that point, I did a bone biopsy of one right. of those lesions last week. So in a couple of weeks, we'll find out if there's something unusual about that right. lesion. Well, you know, it might be that they are resistant, but not totally resistant and that they might respond with more treatment. But let, let me ask anybody in the room, any, anybody have any ideas as to suggestions that for, for Dennis to be talking about when he speaks to Dr. Morris tomorrow, who, by the way, was one of the PIs of the vision trial. Yeah, I, I would ask him, uh, what are the probabilities that these uh, these new lesions arose after the end of your pluvicto treatment versus what Rick is saying that uh, they were arising during pluvicto treatment, but um, at a later point in the therapy, and maybe they only got hit with uh, one or two doses. Yeah, I don't know if he could even answer that, but it's a good question, I guess. Right. Also, being that it sounds like most of you, if not all of your lesions were in the bone, uh, talk to him about radium-223 as a as a possible option yeah. just to see what he thinks about that because i think you've already had two i think you you've had um two taxanes right you no you i had I had, dos, I, I had docetaxel um at the outset which would, would yeah. have been seven years ago okay that you never had cabazitaxel no okay also, yeah, ask them uh, if if they did or if they if they didn't, can they run um, markers for neuroendocrine just to rule that out? Yeah, they're, they're going to do that. Okay. Uh, all the previous biopsies I've had, they they run the neuroendocrine. Okay. Um, so yeah. I. I think that, um, you know, definitely thinking about Jeftana might be a good, Cabazitaxel might be a good option. And then Herb wrote to me um, from somewhere between the East Coast and the West Coast with a very short memo, a very short email that said, what about BAT? I mean, it's worth raising it with your team. Yeah, if, if I want to do BAT, it's been made clear to me, I think I'm going to have to go visit Dr. A in Minneapolis. So okay. we'll leave it at that. Okay. Is is that true in both Chicago and, and, and in, um, oh, and in uh, Madison? Uh, unclear about Chicago, but... But um, given the experience of Dr. A, I think I would maybe I would prefer to do that. Okay. And by the way, um, uh, Dr. Bob put a couple of references to the BAT in the chat window. So uh, Bob Snyder, go into the chat window and just click on the link in the chat window. And they'll yep. open up. You can you can look at them later. Yeah. Um, thank well, you, Doctor Bob, for doing that. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, one question on BAT: Is there any indication of blood clotting while on the high dose testosterone? Has that ever been reported that anyone has seen? I don't know. I don't I, I have John or no Ben that, that, you... yeah that was brought up to me as a as a risk factor but I haven't um, verified that so. 
The, the other thing, um, getting a second read on my two PET scans, the pre-treatment and then the one I had last week. Yep. Uh, I'm going to ask Sloan Kettering to do that. I don't know if they will. So who, um, what, what type of scans were those two? Were they both pilarify scans? Uh, gallium 68. They were both gallium 68. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, I, I think I would ask, I think I would ask Dr. Morris to look at them. I mean, his eye is as good as anybody's. I mean, he's seen enough of these um, through all of the, through all of the clinical trials, you know, he, he was looking at, looking at the scans. So he's pretty familiar. Um, his, his would be a great, I mean, we, we could send them back. I can explain to you how to get them back to Telix and they can reread, the, they'll, they'll give you an overread. But I think I, I would rather have Dr. Morris look at those scans and see what he thinks. Okay, I'll ask him. I think that that would be a great, you know, that's kind of like getting Tom Hope or Peter Carroll to look at them. What, what would you say, Len? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's, it's about as good as you get to have Morris look at them. Dennis, are you going to fly to New York or telehealth? Uh, it's telehealth. Dennis, what kind Anybody? of side effects did you have from the Pluvicto? Um, after the infusion, there's a, a few days, two to three days of fatigue, kind of early in the day before you get going um and some dry mouth in the first week um mostly in the morning after not having fluids for a whole night so those those were kind of the physical symptoms um but then over the course of six treatments i did have uh you know, an impact on my bone marrow. So my blood counts got uh, got knocked down, reds and whites and hemoglobin. So that's that's kind of a watch out uh, for those guys that are going through treatment. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think it might not be a bad idea. And you could ask Dr. Morris about this too whether maybe you just need to allow your blood counts to get back to really healthy levels before you start the next round of treatment, Dennis. Yeah, I, I um, you know, the next systemic treatment that's going to be meaningful for me is going to impact the bone marrow. So I, I do want to get better numbers. So I don't go into a downward spiral. Right. Maybe maybe not BAT. I mean, I don't I don't, you know, I'm very dubious on this BAT, but I've heard a couple of good things recently and maybe not BAT. Yeah. I'm open minded. I, I don't know what the next treatment is at this point. I've had the cabazitaxel and uh, I tolerated that real well. I've heard a lot of people tolerate that better yeah. than uh, uh, some of the other chemos. Yeah, I've heard that so too. I, Thanks for that. Am I way off base or is, is radiation totally out of the question? I thought they did pretty well with stereotactic radiation on lesions that they could identify well the the issue here is the volume it's fine if you've got a very limited amount of volume but dennis 
in this um i mean we didn't really share this so you're not off base norm okay but there are there are a number of lesions in what's called the appendicular skeleton which i learned about today right. but since that's I'll, a term I'll, I'll, that I'll, nobody's I'll probably since that's a term nobody's probably ever heard of because i wasn't familiar with it this is where we go to Dr. John. Dr. John, turn on your microphone and tell these gents what the appendicular skeleton is. Well, I am looking it up as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the appendages are the arms and legs, right? Uh, right. Well, I, yeah. I felt I, ignorant. I, I, yeah. I'll put you out your misery because that's They're exactly what I thought. Of or I thought it an was. Appendage. Yeah, I thought it was your arms and your legs, but it isn't. The appendicular skeleton is the part of the skeleton that attaches the axis skeleton, which is like your spine, to your appendages. So it's your shoulder, it's it's the skeleton across your shoulders and it's your pelvis. That's the appendicular skeleton. Huh. And and we and Dennis has a number of lesions in the appendicular skeleton. So spot radiation is probably not an option. Yeah. Yeah, the the um the most significant lesion, which is where they took the biopsy from, is in the the iliac, which is kind of like the pelvic bone or hip bone. Um, and I was told that a lot of bone marrow is made in, in that region. So if you SBRT that region, that's gonna negatively impact your bone marrow and drop your blood counts. Repeating what I, what I heard. I'm, right gee i just saw my uh, radiation oncologist a couple of days ago i wish i had this question ready for him <laughs> all right well dennis keep us posted i'm very we're, we're all eager to hear what dr morris has to say love to hear what he's got to say about this and you know i think that you know, some, some conventional options might be, or, mar or somewhat conventional options could be the cabazitaxel and the BAT. Um, and then, you know, there's a bunch of trial stuff go going on, but I'm really interested to hear what Dr. Morris says, because he's, you know, one of the experts at PSMA, if not the expert in PSMA uh, Pluvicto in the country. Might as well, does this make sense? I was thinking might as well get some genomics on this new biopsy tissue as well. Not that, not that we know anything about resistance to sure. uh, lutetium or what genomics are correlated with resistance, but if his idea that these are somehow resistant, even if they express PSMA, I don't know, maybe get the genes and see what has changed well i mean they're doing that john yep. it's been sent In off process. yeah oh they're doing it uh, anyway okay not yeah, they're not um, just doing pathology but they're also doing genomic. yeah no it's been sent oh. off for ngs do you know who they sent it to dennis uh, i believe it's going to the same folks that did my last one about a year ago called strata it's in michigan yeah i don't know them yeah I don't know them. I can't. I cannot say. But one thing you might want to do, you might want to offer Dr. Morris some some tissue from that bone biopsy. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna do that this time. Uh, the last one, I, when when the hospital wanted to use Strata, I did a trust me. Uh, but this time, I think I might get a second opinion. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know why they go to Strata. I don't know who they are. Do, will, will they give you an MSI high reading? Does Strata give you an MSI high reading? MSI they reading? I should... Yeah, yeah, they give MSI tumor burden, some some RNA um, okay. indicators. Yeah, I don't think they can do tumor burden from a bone biopsy. They that that has to be done from from blood. Okay. Um. Anyway, let let's move on. If there isn't, if no one else has anything, let's um, let's move on. And the final message. Oh no, I think that's just Larry Fish. I think we have to silence Larry. Um. Um. Okay. Uh, Norm Pollock, please go ahead. You're still showing muted, Norm. Can you? I say I hate go. going after you. There he comes. Like, uh, yeah, I feel like a whiner going after you guys. I'm just too early in this, but anyhow, um, my PSA doubled from 0.01 to 0 0.02, no, 0 0.2 um, in 72 days. And I'm seeing Dr. E on Thursday. I'm driving down to Houston and seeing Dr. E. So that's what she suggests, but uh, I didn't like that PSA doubling time. I really don't want to catch up with you guys. So, the, I mean, the, the, the first thing I'd say to you is you cannot put, and we say this all the time in here, don't put any, don't put too much weight on PSA doubling time when it's at such a low level. Okay. Doubling from, doubling from 10 to 20 is very different from doubling from 0.1 to 0.2. Because it could be a whole bunch of reasons. The tests aren't accurate enough. Okay. And you're still at a low enough level. And I'm sure that that's one of the things that that um, the Dr. Estafio is going to say to you, and I other guys will tell you too. So whilst it's not what you want to see, it, it, it's not... Um, it's not as as significant as doubling at much higher numbers. Anybody want to address that in in the group and and give Norm a little assurance? Yeah, I I I don't even think that should be considered as a doubling. It's just an increase of 0.1. Same thing happened to me a couple of years ago, uh, shortly after my prostatectomy. You know, my PSA went from some tiny level to two or three times that uh, in the space of six weeks. And the uh, oncologist kind of snorted at it and said, you know, that's like having a town with one person in it. One more person comes in and you've doubled the population, but you still only got two. So I, I don't think I'd feel too grim about that until you see your doc. Yeah, but where are you now, though? Happen to happen to be non-detectable now. Okay. After what? I I I don't know your history, so I, I you know. I... Yeah, yeah. I uh, I'm I'm a Gleason nine. I had a prostatectomy. Then the story I just told you happened, and then I went on um, ADP, uh and uh, had radiation, and now I'm undetectable. Okay. Well, that's, that's what, um, that's Norm, what I'm, Norm, Norm, the, the way, this is Peter, the way I've looked at it, I've been there several times, continue to always be there, is anything below one, I look at as a glass half full rather than half empty. I see it as an opportunity to let it climb enough to get a PSMA scan and see if there's really something to wonder about. Uh, so I don't get excited. I don't really get excited. I see it as an opportunity rather than something weird. Um, and 
and let it let it you know let it go up to 0.8 or something like that, and then scan it and find out what's really going on. Yeah, they did they did the PSMA pet in uh, the middle of October, and it actually yeah. was negative. But he but the doc said he, he wanted to see one. right. Well, he said I want to see if they because I I refuse to have my lymph nodes out because I listened to some of the some of the the docs talking that you know that unless you take 30 or 40 lymph nodes, it's kind of a waste of time was what the pathologist was saying. So I refused to have my lymph nodes taken because I watched my wife go through that. And uh, so he wanted to see if maybe there was some lymph node involvement and he thought it, it would show up without a high PSA. So that's why he did the PSMA. Well, usually you gotta let it get up around 0.8 and then, then it's worthwhile doing a PSMA scan. So think think about it as, as as this is a positive ride, not not something terrible going on. It's a chance to really, if something that is actually happening, you get a chance to actually find out where it is. Well, the um, the urologist, because I, I saw him today, well, told me with him today, and he said, yeah, I suggest you jump on it and 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 do the ADT and the radiation. So, but I want to see what Doctor E has to say. Well, the ADT will knock it down and you know, just and put it off, right. which you can do, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. So what do you think about what do you guys think about the radiation this early? Pretty well, early. I would say, well, it is. Go ahead, Peter. Go ahead. Pretty early, and you don't know where the target is. I mean, it's like old school. It's like when I did radiation, they just kind of shoot, shoot for the pelvic pelvic area. And, um, without a target. Now yeah, well, they're calling it salvage or ad adjuvant, depending on right. how you look at it. Because my prostatectomy will—it'll be a year at the end of this month. So, so I, I would say a couple of things. First of all, I'm going to put in the chat window an article that was sent to me from the lady at Cardinal Health today. That was some research published by Johns Hopkins last week that feels, that suggests that if you're going to do salvage radiation, it's good to do it um, at less than 0 0.5. So you, you have plenty of time. Um, it, it's right there. I just put it in, open it up and read it later. Um, there was also research last year, which I have bookmarked somewhere, but maybe one of the other guys, uh, sorry, not last year, this is probably about three years old now, Len may remember it, that um, says that it makes no difference if you start uh, salvage radiation three months out or eight months out, you get the same result. And, and the research that came out this week seems to say it's not so much how long you take, it's where your PSA is when you start. So you're, you're, you're in good shape there. Um, what, what do the other guys think about when to start salvage radiation? Rick, I, I had to drop off and I just came back in and I heard your question. So this may be out of context, but, um, Traditionally, they would tell you that post-prostatectomy, salvage radiation would begin be anytime between 0 0.2 and 0 0.5 PSA. I don't, I don't know if that's still considered standard of care. Yeah, I just, I just put a link in the chat window that you should open, Len, that, that supports that. It was a piece published in Prostate this past um, two or three weeks from Johns Hopkins that would agree with that. But, um, you know, they're... Well. Yeah, well, I'm not adverse to being aggressive, but, you know, I know there's side effects to everything. But... Uh, Norm, I was given radiation with an undetectable PSA with a bunch of other stuff too, but there was no indication at all that that did me any good. I mean, I'm doing fine, but the, there's no way to know. Yeah, I know. That's, if it's yeah. had any, you know, uh, it's an unusual thing to do. And the thing is, just like the prostatectomy itself, to the layman, the 
it looked like a great idea. You know, it's already it's undetectable. Why not just go ahead and try to knock out what's left now? But there's there's no there's no evidence that this uh, that this does any good. Well, I, I would I would have had the radiation to begin with if I had known what I had. But when I went into it, I was a Gleason seven, came out of Gleason nine, grade five. So, yeah. Well, hold on a second, Jimmy. Are you saying there's no evidence that says that salvage radiation does not do good? No, I'm saying there's no uh, evidence that what's known as adjuvant when it when it's uh, you post prostatectomy, you have undetectable PSA. And they go after whatever remnants might be there anyway with full pelvic radiation. Mm -hmm. And in my case, Zytig, uh, uh, chemo, you know, I mean, right. the kitchen sink approach, does it, does it do any good? The, 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 the layman's logic is that, oh, yeah, give me everything now because I'm young and I can handle it and all that. But there is no, there is, there's no data that that does anything, you know, superior. But Norm, Norm doesn't have an undetectable PSA. He doesn't. I know. That's. I'm not uh, saying it applies to it applies to Norm, but it's kind of a, the only analogy is that you know when do you do it? You know, do you do it when it's 0.1? Do you do it when it's point? You know, a little lower than that, a little higher than that. And what you said, Rick, about you know the, the, it indicating that he has time. Uh, you know, that's the evidence that I've heard of. Is that you? You have a, a threshold beneath which um, it's not going to make a lot of difference if you do it or not. But when it gets to that point, then you go. But I know it must be controversial. You know, I don't know. Norm, another 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 theory is which I've been doing is well, at least in nine level, the likelihood of dealing with this reoccurring numerous times in the, in the future is pretty strong. Yep. And you and my attitude is get as much mileage out of each treatment as I can. You know, if I if I can make it two years after one thing before I do something else, that's a big plus. Rather than keep jumping on everything trying to think I can cure this or get rid of it. Right. Yeah, I I know it's going to come back, but I'm just I I don't know. I, I don't know if getting ahead of it. It's, yeah, it's a. I mean, it's about a towing cost. I mean, towing cost. You can, you can, yeah, towing, towing cost. Yeah, um, I don't know. It's it's tough decisions. And, you know, I, I'm sorry. What what is your PSA right now? Uh, zero point two, but I was undetectable in January. So the doc's not happy with the way it's moving. I'm not happy with the way it's moving. When was your press attack to me, Norm? November 29th last year. So I'm just not quite a year, just about. Yeah. You know, like I say, I, I, I kind of chose the press attack to me only because all the reading I did beforehand was like 30% of the guys were upgraded after they had the prostatectomy from what they had, you know, and, and sure enough, I was in that 30%. I went from a seven to a nine. Yeah. Let, 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 let me let me sort respond as best as I can to this. Okay, it's it's a toughie because you were a four plus three before and you were a five plus four when you came out. Had you been a five plus four beforehand, and I, I don't know if um if you got your slides, it's water under the bridge if they got reread or they didn't, but if you'd been a five plus four initially, you probably wouldn't have done the the, the radical prostatect. Right, I've done the radiation, yeah. But but knowing that you were a five plus four coming out, I think you've done phenomenally well. Phenomenally well. I mean, again, it's the glass half full rather the glass half empty. To go a year and still only be at point two and to have had five plus four, which mm -hmm. probably meant that it was out the capsule before you even started, right. I think you're doing great. And I think it bodes really well for whatever treatment comes up. Yeah. And I, I think that as hard as it is to do, this is where we bring David Muslin into the picture. Oh, is he sleeping there? Oh, I think, I think, I, I, no, no, that's Russ. That's Russ who's sleeping. I'm sorry. But this is where we bring David Muslin 
to the picture. If you stay in the moment and you think positively about this, it's going to stress you way less. And the stress is one of the things that makes it worse. Oh, I know. So that's what I'm saying. Anybody want to comment on that? I just want to add real quick to agree with that completely because if you you have no other treatment besides the prostatectomy so far, right, Norm? Correct. Oh yeah, well, that, that, I concur completely that that's that's a great result so far. Well, the other thing is it's going to probably just do whatever Doctor E suggests. Just leave it at that. Let let her decide. Then I don't have to decide. Yeah, but that's, I don't want you to go in with that attitude and neither does she, mm -hmm. you know, you've got to be, you've got to have your questions. You've got to be ready. You should be, feel comfortable challenging her and asking the whys. Um, so, you know, be prepared, be prepared and, and, and see what she says. Yeah. What do, do I value her opinion? Great. But hers is not the only opinion. And but if you like what she's saying and you feel comfortable with it, go with it. And well, like I say, I just I, you know, I, but well, naturally the radiation. I already saw the radiation oncologist, and he's like, yeah, let's do this. And you know, the Euro guy today was he probably should go ahead and do this. So that's what I was gonna. Well, the question is when, and you know, it, to allow it to allow it to rise enough so that we might be able to see what's on the PSMA scan is probably, if it were me, I think that's what I'd be doing. You wouldn't even take the ADT? No, because if you take the ADT, it's going to, you're not going to see where, where the cancer is. Yeah. Just plain oh. statistically, you know, like before we had PSMA scans, I think that the chances are overwhelmingly in favor of this tiny bit being in your pelvis, which means it will be shot at by the radiation. And that's what they're telling me. And radiation, unlike ADT, can kill cancer cells. I, I think the chances of it being outside where they'd radiate are very small, but the guys are right. It's it's you'll find out exactly if you wait long enough and scan wait too long and if it's aggressive then it's outside and yeah i i don't know it's a tough decision norm without going into all the gory details i made it 11 months before i had to do radiation after my prostatectomy and then i made it about a year and a half and i had to go back and do uh, some proton radiation for a couple of lymph nodes that were up in my chest. And then I made it about another year and a half to two years before I had to do chemo because I had another recurrence. And now I'm back I'm trying to figure out what to do next. So that's, you know, just kind of expect this and just yeah, you know, like, go, yeah. for the, go for the ride. And there's new things, there's new ways to deal with it. And you'll, you'll be okay. I don't like this ride. Sorry. None of us. None of us. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make it a little lighter. Yeah. Right. I've wanted to get off this ride for quite a while now. They won't let me off. So what are you going to do? I know. I know. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm pretty well resigned, but I just, you know, I want to, I want to do whatever's best to do at the time to slow down what you, what most of you guys are doing. I just want to slow that down. You guys scare me to death. <laughs> well, I, 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 don't, I, I never, I never sleep on Monday and Tuesday nights. <laughs> so, so well, delay, no, some of us have delay. been doing it for years, for years, and we're still. Yeah, I know. Delay, delay, delay. Just like yep. Trump's lawsuits, you just keep delaying. <laughs> Why not? But delaying can okay. bite you. Anyhow, I think. I think, I think we've milked this one about as much as we can do, but it is a very good conversation and helpful for everybody. So um, we are going to talk to Dr. Jack. Dr. Jack, tell us where you are. Thank you. Um, 
So I've been struggling with this avidity, non-avidity with the PSMA. I've had two PSMA scans. On the, on the West Coast, Dr. Carroll thinks the reason it hasn't uh, uh, been avid is because the level was too low when I had the scans, respectively at 0.36 and 0.52, both times non-avid. So I decided to go with the advice of Sloan Kettering, which is get an axiom scan. Last Friday, I had an axiom scan expecting maybe something to show up. Nothing showed up at all. And my PSMA of my PSA doubling time has taken off after you know five years of being very flat. Now today's PSMA PSA was 1.14 at the Sylvester Lab at, here in Miami, which I think and hope is 20% higher, like it is at Sloan Kettering compared to the Quest Lab, which on uh, 10 days ago was 0.93. So to go from 0.93 to 1.14 was quite a jolt, but who knows? I'll call the lab tomorrow and see if they have a different method of, uh, of uh, doing it. Now, the thing about the Axiom scan, um, sort of a, a new sort of surprising and somewhat shocking outcome was that it, it was all non-avid for Axiom, the, 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 the so-called nodules and bony spicules and everything else that was sh sh has shown up over the past uh, year in the PSMA scans, nothing has grown and nothing was avid. But I ended up with a cystic liver um, growth that measured a, um, four months ago, 1.7 times 1.5 centimeters that measured Friday 2.4 times 2.2 centimeters, a liver it looks like a cyst. When I looked at it this morning with um, Dr. Belusic, it was round. It was. It didn't look angry. It didn't look. But then he said there's no way of determining whether it's, you know, a cyst or whether it's a cyst adenoma, whether it's a cyst adenocarcinoma, whether it's something else. So we ran a bunch of studies on the um, uh, tumor markers, and they all came out negative. However, I'm getting an MRI on Thursday if the hurricane doesn't come here, and uh, I will. Uh, then make, hopefully they'll be able to tell me whether this is something to be concerned about or if it's just it's a cyst that grew abnormally rapid. Usually the criteria for rapidity or concern is that if it grows more than three to five millimeters a year, this grew centimeters, um, this quite a bit, 0.7 centimeters. Uh, and uh, that's that's of concern. And what, that's why Belusich wanted me to go ahead and get an uh, MRI immediately. So I'm anxious about that and I, I can't understand. However, it is concurrent with uh, my, my, my PSA rise. Four months, the PSA has risen aggressively and so has this growth in the liver. And whatever the growth is in the liver, it doesn't show up uh, on the PET scan as being added to anything uh, unless uh, I repeated an, uh, an FDG scan or, or, or some other reagent that would, you know, uh, show it, show, show, show it to be uh, significant. So we're going to go with the MRI, and I'm, I'm a bit anxious on that. I asked Dr. Belusich what, what my options are, and he said basically three options: do nothing, just see what happens, go on relugalix uh, intermittently six months on, and then go off until the PSA gets uncomfortable and you want to go back on. He said. He said, however, keep in mind that if you do either of those two options, it's not going to make a difference in your lifespan. And that was new to me. And I asked him, how do you know that? He said, well, that's basically what the literature says. I, and I was confused because I didn't know that those that option was around long enough to make that determination. I mean, who's been using intermittent uh, relugalix or, or intermittent ADT for a long enough period to determine that it doesn't make a difference in your longevity? So that confused me. And uh, then uh, he said to me, or you can go for the uh, Relugal plus IMRT and uh, like recommended by your radiation oncologist. And I wanted to do that back when it was 0 0.36, 0 .0, as we've talked tonight, 0 0.32. And however, uh, I was told to go for the visual and this was not you guys, it was other people who were saying, let's find it first so we know what we're shooting for. And that made sense to me. But now that in retrospect, I kind of wonder, you know, so I'm, that's where I am. And uh, 
discombobulated as usual, but uh, and confused. And uh, Norm, uh, I can understand uh, your angst as I feel it. And uh, but I have I'm different. I'm 15 years. I'm 20 years out since I had my prostatectomy, and I didn't show up for 15 years with uh, significant um, PS. That's my story, Rick. Okay. I don't know. Well, Let me go ahead, Dr. John. Well, I was going to say, I hope your MRI uh, settles it so that you can, so that you can uh, be less fearful. Have you heard of, what's that? Have you ever heard of uh, a prostate cancer situation showing up in the liver and, and, and not lighting up with any of these uh, other, you know, reagents uh, just just by itself an isolated cyst that grows well i don't think it's that likely that this is a prostate cancer in that liver but the mri will give us some more information by characterizing the lesion a little bit you know i've been following chromogranin for years and nothing has shown up and i was always concerned about that yeah i mean we don't usually see liver mets especially when there's not any bone or or lymphoid kind of diathesis and I didn't know if the, you know with whether I would have the de novo type of neuroendocrine never treated other than prostatectomy and Scardino told me that's always a possibility and so I gather he has seen a de novo neuroendocrine a friend of mine died of that so I've heard that yeah. it happens but uh, usually is a late onset development Rick? right I mean it's just without treatment over so many years that's what would make it strange strange you know i mean normally the neuroendocrine would crop up much earlier or it would crop up as a result of lots of different treatments um one thing that is occurring to me depending on its location is um it's pretty easy to do a liver biopsy can't do that I reviewed the literature today on that. It's too risky if it is a cancer of seeding throughout the liver. So they can't do that. They have to do a resection. They won't go to, if it's a cyst, they can do it. And they can do it. They can guide it with an MRI or with an ultrasound. And they can go in with a needle and you can just drain it if it's symptomatic. If it's not, you leave it alone, you watch it. If it's a possible cancer and it shows all the criteria of a cancer or even if it's an angioma, just type of, you know, um, vascular thing, you can't biopsy. First, you'll either hemorrhage to death or you'll seed it throughout the liver. So you have to resect and take a section out of it. If, if, if it can't make a determination when they do the MRI. Well, I mean, I've, I've, I've known guys have liver biopsies oh, yeah. over the years. I did them when I was an intern. <laughs> so I've done liver Yeah, biopsies. no, 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 no. I'm talking about in a prostate cancer environment i know that they, they i've known them do it did, did you discuss it with belusic yeah he said let's wait for the mri let's not even okay think. so you know wait for the mri but i i i've never i have not heard before of a risk of seeding from a liver biopsy for prostate cancer oh, for, for prostate. kidney cancer if you know yeah, it it's a big deal it's if you can determine it to be prostate cancer, then it's not risky, maybe. But, you know, I'm talking about if it's a cyst, if it's a cystoadenoma, uh, a cystoadenocarcinoma, you know, something like that. Those things can seed. And I don't know, maybe yeah. others can seed. I, I can, I'll send you the site I just read. Okay. But, well, and the doubling um a couple of months now it's gone from uh, four months ago my doubling time was 14 months a year ago it was 36 months and now it's maybe two months two three months is this aggressivity is this volume what what, what causes such a rapid uh, if you said stress is an important variable that can make this happen it's certainly you know i, I don't know how to be that mellow about that whole situation you know i, I am feeling the stress of the rapidity of my doubling time. Can you, um, can you, can you package this Axiomen scan and, and um, what it saw on the liver and um, send it to Dr. Carroll for a comment? Oh, I will tomorrow. I just got it today. 
Okay. I'll send it all to Dr. Carroll. I'm going to send him a copy, a hard copy too, and maybe have, you know, Tom, uh, Thomas Hope, if you will, read it. I'll also send it to Sloan Kettering. I have three copies. I'll send the whole thing. How do you get, how do you get um, um, blue diagnostics or any of those Telix to read it? I asked Belusa, I asked Belusa, if he can get that. He didn't know what I was talking about. How, how do you get them to do a reread? I don't, I've never spoken to um, Blue Earth about rereads, although I did, <laughs> I did tell them that I think, um, I shouldn't say I've never spoken to Blue Earth about rereads. In September, when I was in um, Washington for the Prostate Cancer Impact Alliance meetings, I did say to the Blue Earth lady, you know, these rereading these scans is an important issue um i think she said to me but i'm not sure jack that you that they will reread them but to be honest again if you if you've got somebody like peter carroll looking at that no he, he's as good as anybody you know sure. it's a question of who's looking at it i mean if you're if you're in the middle of the somebody's seen 20 acumen scans in their career that's one thing but you know peter's done all this stuff comparing acumens to psma scans and so you don't need blue earth to write to to okay. to, to reread it if you can get peter carroll to reread it right or tom's hope yeah or tom hope but you know but your relationship is with peter and if Peter's not sure about something, he's going to go ask one of his, you know, one of his compatriots like, like Hope. So for me, it's a non-issue if that's the quality of just, just like with Dennis and, and, and Mike Morris reading. Right. Yeah, he's having a seminar on Morris. I just, I just heard yeah. So I'm Kettering's having a, some kind of a seminar, a webinar with Morris. I have it on my calendar. I don't know when. Right. So, so, you know, I think the next step is the MRI. Try and figure out what's going on. And, I mean, obviously something's going on because the PSA is, 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 is creeping up and creeping up. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think what I would probably do in your own mind is have a threshold number and say, at this point, I'm not waiting anymore and start some ADT and see if it comes down. What do you mean? Whether that number is going to be if what two. Comes... Go ahead. If what comes down, see if it comes down. What is the it? The PSA comes down. Why would you doubt that it wouldn't? Why would you say if, if it's not hormone sensitive, it won't come down? Oh, oh, you mean de novo from from scratch? It could be non-hormone sensitive. Well, for whatever reason, it could have changed. It could have morphed. We don't know. It well, should come down. Never been treated. But, it, it, but it's not. You know, if it's not PSA avid, and we don't know what's going on, so there's something weird going on. Do the ADT if you if if the PSA comes down, you know it's a hormone sensitive cancer. No, I've I've never heard of a non-hormone sensitive cancer other than those that have been treated with hormones that become refractory to hormones. It could it, be any it could be some type some type of neuroendocrine that you haven't picked up through chromogranin. So the chromogranin is yeah. That would be terrifying. I don't know. I mean, it, you know, it, it's a long shot, but you, you're not, you, you're obviously not common or garden. I mean, here your PSA is at 1.4. You've done three, P, your PSA is at 1.4. You've done three PSMA scans. You've done an Axiomen scan. And the only thing we're possibly seeing is some sort of a liver lesion. And we don't know if that's from prostate cancer. But you've been watching out for chromogranin for years, as you said. Yeah, first one five years ago at, at the Mayo. That's the first one I had done, and they did it. I didn't even know about it, but that's where it came from. They invented it, so to speak. 
So when Quan, he ran that in 2018 for me, and it turned out to be, you know, non-significant. I've, I've been, you know, running them ever since. CEAs, chromogrammins, and all kinds of. Okay, <laughs> so that's why I'm saying, go on, go on the ADT, and that, and that's an acid test. What about what I said before, what Belusic said, you, it, it doesn't make a difference if you do nothing or take the ADT in terms of longevity? Well, I'll let someone else re you refer to the reference, but the intermittent hormone therapy goes back, I think, to 2012 was when Hussein first talked about it. Okay. And she flips one way to the other so that there's there is a fair amount of knowledge and 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 in originally she said that it was what's the phrase um that it was was it non-significant i can't remember the the right phrase but she basically said if you go on the intermittent hormone therapy it's no worse than staying on therapy all the time and then she changed her mind, and then she changed her mind again. Um, there's a lot of research on intermittent hormone therapy, and there's a lot of guys who have done it here. And um, I think that what Belusic is saying to you is that, why don't you try the, the intermittent hormone therapy? Because you're probably going to get as much out of it as going on um, permanent hormone therapy. But he's, I don't, I think what he, I don't think he's saying to you is that if you do nothing, you're better off. He didn't say better off. He said, it's not going to make much of a difference if you do nothing compared to if you do intermittent. That's what he said. I heard it this morning. And that's where I questioned it because I've been listening to you guys and all, and it doesn't seem like I've heard that anything like that before. So you're saying it's, who is she? You're talking about Misha Hussein. Dalton. Maha Hussein. Hussein, not her Misha Beltran. No, she's she's old enough to be Misha Beltran's mother. Okay. So I know Beltran. She's one of the she's one of the she's one of the old dames of, of prostate cancer, along with uh, Cora Sternfeld and 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 Maha Hussein, and I think there's a third one out. Oh, I know there is a third one out there, but I can't remember her name offhand. What is her name again? Maha Hussein, M A H A H U S S E I N. She's at Northwestern, and we have ex experience with her. Uh, it's not Mary Ellen Taplin, Ben. There's, um, although she is, she's been around a long time. That's not the one I was thinking of. There's another one, and I can't think of her name. But Mary Ellen Taplin's a good suggestion. Um, is it Sloven, Rick? No, it's not Sloven, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, the uh, Anybody want to talk to Dr. Jack about intermittent hormone therapy or, you know, what Blusic is suggesting? I think some of it, Jack, unfortunately is, and you know this, is, the, is just the... Um, the actuarial forecasts of, 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 of how long you have to live, which doesn't take an awful lot into account. So he's basing it on that, you know? Rick, uh, like, do I agree? Jack, no. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I would say this, um, and I guess this is speculation on my part, but um, he's probably saying that there's no data to show, no, no, uh, a randomized clinical trial to show that ADT is superior to no treatment because it would be unethical to run such a trial. Um, so in that sense, I guess he can say that, but um, I'll tell you this, I, I had bone nets uh, over three years ago and I went on um, hormone therapy. And uh, for the last, well, after 
maybe a year and a half of hormone therapy, the, the, the bone metastases were undetectable. And um, now three plus years after that, my PSA is extremely low, 0 0.07. So I kind of doubt that if I didn't do anything in the last three years, that I would be doing that well. But, you know, no, there's really no, that's anecdotal. There's no data. You've only had uh, ATT. You haven't had, you didn't have any additional uh, chemo or radiation? No chemo. And I had radiation therapy well before the bone meds, three years before the bone meds. That's good to hear. It's good to hear. It makes sense. Thank you. Sure. Any anybody else have anything they'd like to add for Dr. Jack? I just don't want to see Dr. Jack uh, grieve a loss that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> How do you do that, John? <laughs> It's really, it's really intuitive. <laughs> is is that one shrink to a, is that advice from one shrink to another? Is that what we consider that? <laughs> well done, very calibrated, John. <laughs> that's, that's no that's that's no better than saying, eh, hey, don't worry about it." I guess. <laughs> I got one daughter. All right, one beautiful, wonderful daughter who. Who is not married and she has no children and i grieve in advance for her because i hate the thought of her being alone and that's my my biggest you know but i guess we all have to deal with things like that i, I just don't want to see her at least for now have to suffer any immediate loss if, if it happens fast you know so if i stick around a little while it'd be okay 83 is good i'm happy i'm grateful you know i get spoiled but my mother made it to 101. So that gave me a benchmark, you know, to give me a <laughs> to shoot for. Wow. Wow. Yeah, my, my father, my father died at 85. At, at least stick around long enough for me to come down and visit David Muslin again so we can all go out. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, well, unbelievably, we've been to everybody who was here before, but there's a few newbies who came in and I have to check with them. Julian, was there anything on your mind? No, I, I have an appointment with Dr. E next week, so I'll be doing blood work. So we'll see how it goes. Okay. And Dr. John, was there anything you wanted to raise? Well, uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that I am, uh, we talked about intermittent hormone therapy. I am starting uh, a, a drug holiday as of right now. I'm not going to get. I. I lost you for a second there, John. I think I may have, might have frozen. I'm not no, sure. No, I lost him too. We all lost him. I think yeah, he said say it. that again. Say it again, Dr. John. Oh, there he goes. I think he was saying he was going to start a speaking holiday. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my, my uh, uh, go-to has crashed about five times during this session already and yeah uh, it every everything just goes blank and then comes on about 20 seconds later and i have to turn on the mic and the camera again is that happening to you guys too it happened to me john maybe it has something to do with connecticut residents <laughs> affirmative here it, oh it's, it's happened to me the whole meeting john yeah well anyway what i was just trying to say is that I'm uh, starting a, a uh, drug holiday now and we'll see how it goes. Which drug? Now, ADT yes. and, and darolutamide. 
Oh. And I'm on when does the off. when does the ADT wear off? Well, Dr. Petrolak says it'll be about a year, and uh, Dr. Shumway says his formula is to take the interval of your Lupron shots and double it. So my last two Lupron shots were four months, so it'd be eight months by his calculation. So it's going to be a long time. I get what I meant was when does this existing shot that you're on wear off? Now. Okay. Last shot was four months ago. How long yeah. do you guys last on these drug holidays before your PSA comes up again? I'm 15 I months off and I'm, and I'm six weeks off darolutamide and my PSA is going up and I'll probably have to make a decision uh, after I talk to my docs in a couple of weeks. Six weeks, wow, that's really short, huh? I've been on a drug holiday for five months and my PSA has not budged. Good. But this is my this is my fourth holiday in eight years. Oh yeah, you've had longer ones before, right? I never made never made it the past two years. Never made it to a year and a half usually. So hmm. year and a half's not bad. No. Well, hey, Jody, come on. It depends on how fast your your uh, T levels recover. Right. Right. So right. Len, Mark Valens, Mark, Mark Valens, you said five months. Uh, what what's your T level? Um, my my testosterone didn't budge for four months, uh, and now is approaching normal but my doctors aren't worried about it as long as the psa is still undetectable so your t level was dormant for four months and then forced to the fifth month and you're almost at normal it stayed down near seven eight nine for I, I'm, I'm getting tested once a month, and then it came up to, oh, I don't remember the numbers, about halfway back, and the next month it was almost all the way back to normal. So it's probably in the high 100s or something like that now, huh? Not 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 that high yet. It's it's low range of whatever normal is. I forgot what that is. I think it's 200 normally. Yeah, or 250. <laughs> Len, why don't you share your experience? You're, you're Mr. Intermittent. Yeah, Mr. Uh, John probably knows this already from the lunch we had together. Um, well, I was on a drug holiday for 28 months, but um, I was, the PSA was rising at 20 months after 20 after 20 months but still it's pretty it's pretty good over a year and a half so so we will have to see john what was your testosterone level before you um went on adt i was on supplementary testosterone for uh hypogonadism after a head injury for several years. Oh, okay. And I had uh, at that time testosterone levels of, like uh, in the 200s uh, and the 300s. I think my natural testosterone level is something like 130 or 110 or something like that without supplementation. Mm -hmm. Hey, Len, what was your testosterone up to? You've had some pretty high ones. I did, yeah. While I was on drug holiday, it went up as high as 900. How many times have you been off and on it, Len? Uh, three times I've been on drug holiday. My latest one, which is still ongoing, 
is now um, going into its 11th month. Over what time period? Uh, well, January, no, early no. January till now, I'm still, oh, you mean the whole? Total, total time period, how long? Oh, yeah, doing? sure. Uh, that is um, about eight and a half years, just like Peter. We were diagnosed about the same time. Okay. Peter Kafka. You know, John, I wasn't on intermittent, but uh, the testosterone going back, and Rick's referred to this before, the reading you get, I mean, it can be all over the place. <clears throat> At six months, I went from having been under 10 for the entire time I was an ADT to, uh, I, and in one month, I went from 20, uh, 24 to 250. The next month, I was 117, and the next month, I was 550. <laughs> But that shows you how it can go. Yeah, yeah. Does um, do they know if they if, if the the cancer feeds off the of the free or the, and and the bound or does it just because I mean that I, I I did I did testosterone replacement for about eight years previous to this um, and you know and they always Probably. had free and bound was a big difference. Probably free testosterone. Yeah, that's what I kind of thought. So if they're, if they're just doing total, a lot of it can be bound and not even available. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jim Barnes, is there anything on your mind tonight? Uh, hi, guys. <clears throat> yes, um, if there's a uh, time here tonight, sure. I've you know, I'm going for my seventh round of uh, chemo uh, this coming Friday. So, um, you know, and the thing I think it's on my mind is I'm, you know, I'm having some symptoms that are evolving or changing. You know, I some of the symptoms I had before, like had a problem with my saliva gland, and um, and that went away. But now I have a, a tear duct problem, and my eyes are watering all the time. I tried to play golf yesterday and. Couldn't, couldn't even see the ball, let alone hit it. Um, I can occasionally hit it when I can see good, but it was uh, particularly <laughs> bad yesterday. But, um, you know, that, that and, um, but I, and, and I'm, I have a problem with swollen ankles. You know, all of a sudden that started into my fifth or sixth treatment. So it took a long time for that to happen. I am on prednisone. Um, so, um, but I'm not sure if the, you know, so I actually, I quit taking prednisone for a couple of days last week and it didn't seem to help. So I'm thinking, is it the chemotherapy that's, that's giving me the swollen ankles or, or what, but I'm just wondering if anybody find any thing for relief for, um, the tear duct issue, uh, which I, by the way, I started taking, started doing eye drops for dry eye because the physician assistant told me actually it might be dry eye causing the tearing overreacting but i'm just wondering if anybody had any solutions for the tear duct thing or swollen ankles and i've tried things like the compression socks and she also gave me a prescription for lasix um you know you know get rid of any excess water that sort of thing but i just think if i had if i had a minute here i just decided to throw that out there and see if anybody has any ideas how many chemo cycles are you going to do? You know, you originally prescribed me uh, 10 cycles of uh, chemotherapy, so I'm doing number seven coming up here. But the intention was just to get a treatment or two of docetaxel in so I could get to Plavicto, which is another question. When the heck is Plavicto going to be more readily available? Um, but that, that's kind of, that's kind of where I'm at. So I'm going on number seven. I was prescribed 10, but originally our intention wasn't to do all 10, but I figured, I guess the, the, the studies show that people who go through more chemo do better than those people who say that you go on ABC, anything but chemo. I had um, those, same, I had those same symptoms between five and six of my chemo cycle. Swollen ankles and stuff, and the, and clearing up. But I only did six cycles, and it cleared up after I got off of chemo. 
Okay, how long did it take to clear up? Uh, I can't remember, but it, it, the ankles cleared up pretty fast. The, the, uh, the tearing maybe took not several weeks. Three weeks maybe. Yeah, Jim. I, yes. I, I'm just you know two weeks out from my sixth, and I found t uh, you know especially if between after the fourth and on tearing, runny nose. And they said it's you know definitely the chemo. I'm two weeks out from the le my six, and it's starting to get better. So it doesn't seem to be too long lasting, but it is a pain. Yeah. Oh, and I definitely have the runny nose thing. I think I've lost all my nostril hair and my sinus hair that yeah. would prevent the the nose from running. So it's con constant runny nose. It's it's a pain. <clears throat> Just you get a lot, you get a lot of ble deal with. bleeding. Bloody nose too? Yes, I have had bloody noses. Not not significant bloody noses, but when I blow my nose, there's blood on a tissue. Yeah, same thing. Have Jim, you... I just did a quick Google search on that. And uh, it's, yes, it's very common with docetaxel to have those symptoms. And uh, they suggested for the tear ducts, uh, warm compress might help. Oh. That's a good tip. Or give that a try. That's pretty simple. Sure. Thanks for yeah, looking and, at Yeah, you know, I, I was going to say, I mean, it's probably worth sending an email to Dr. Appleman and asking him, as well as the nurses, um, see what he's got up his sleeve. And this, there are some, um, there are these cancer ophthalmologists, onco ophthalmologists and they have all kinds of tricks up their sleeve for what to do and so you you know if 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 there is one in in um in pit at pit then it would be really good to 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 talk to them sure that's a great idea so you oh. know you could ask dr appleman could you ask one of the onco ophthalmologists if they have any suggestions or does he have any suggestions don't just rely on the chemo nurses yeah. right well but they were physician assistants they work side by side with appleman all the time but point well taken okay. yeah yeah for sure yeah. you can get an eye mask that's got some kind of like beads in it i've used them and you put it in the microwave for 20 seconds and it stay keeps it really warm for five minutes or so and it just it's good for any kind of eye problem as far as i'm concerned you might want to try it out yeah you can get it on that. amazon yeah yeah well hey jim <clears throat> one other thing that was suggested to me was um because a little bit of docetaxel ends up excreted in the tears was to especially the first few days after chemo use a lot of the eye drops just because it apparently it can clog up the tear ducts. Okay. Good idea. Well, you you got a few good suggestions. Yeah, you're, you're, you're lucky we uh, you're you're very lucky that we didn't um, have any new people because we've had loads of time tonight. So. I think we've covered everybody, although there's somebody on the telephone who has been going out and coming in. Oh, just left when I said somebody on the telephone. <laughs> so they maybe didn't want to be identified. Okay. I was going to I, ask them if they wanted to say anything. Hey, is there, that, is there any word? Does anybody know anything about the availability of Plavicto and what the status of that is? Have anybody heard any updates? Yeah, I mean, it, it's read, it's pretty readily available at this point. Are you hearing that? Are you hearing of centers that are, um, are still very backed up? The, the last, uh, at my last chemo treatment, which was two day, two weeks and change ago, um, they said, they said they were still having problems getting it. So I'll revisit that definitely this Friday. Um, so, I mean, the, what I know is that they were trying to keep everybody supplied, um, who they were trying to keep all their existing, um, 
centers supplied and not taking on new centers. Um, and they expected sometime around now to be start reach, starting to reach out to new centers. So I guess that from our perspective, we don't see a problem because these are all older centers and they were given priority. Um, but I know, for example, that somebody like Dr. E in Houston, she's been put on hold. So if Pitt never had um, had the drug before, yeah, there may be some there may be some wait time there. But if you went to Chicago, for example, you you get it quickly. Or if you went to a center that is being supplied, you could get it pretty quickly. Rick, I had one other suggestion for Jim, along with those um, warm compresses, Jim. I would um, suggest a lubricant gel eye drops, which you can get over the counter at the drugstore, but make sure they're, they say lubricant and that they're gel eye drops. You can use them as often as necessary, and they will help alleviate the dry eye temporarily. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, thank you. You get that one? Did you get that one, Mr. Barnes? I did. I did. Never, never heard of such a thing, gel eye drops. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Rick, I've got a question on Andrew James, if uh, you have a minute. Yes, uh, go ahead. From, from my understanding, the androgens are made up of testosterone and also dihydrotestosterone. And when you're on ADT therapy, does that, uh, I know the, the testosterone works on a pituitary, but the uh, dihydrotestosterone it, is that affected in the same way with ADT therapy or, uh, for example, if you have a, a, a PSA or a PSA test and it's gone down but not completely, would that indicate that the cancer is feeding on the dihydrotestosterone? I guess, I, I mean, I'm, I'm going to have to defer here. But my knowledge is that the dihydrotestosterone is about 10 times more powerful, uh, sorry, about 20 times more powerful, and it's about 10% of your testosterone level. And that when you go on ADT, it cuts both the, 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 the um, dihydrotestosterone and the testosterone down um, so that if you've got reduced testosterone, it's reduced both the regular and the dihydrotestosterone. Um, and I think the, and I believe the androgen blocker blocks both of them, but let me defer to my brain's trust. <laughs> yeah, I think you've got that right, Rick. Uh, the testosterone is converted to dihydrotestosterone intracellularly, so it's, it's done in the cell. Um, so I think I remember reading years ago that it was just an in vitro uh, study, but it showed that uh, drugs like um, dutasteride and finasteride uh, which blocked the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone were able to lower the levels of DHT intracellularly more than just uh, what ADT could do. I hope that was intelligible. <laughs> if the I mean, PSA the line... does not go down after treatment, uh, I'm, I'm using Firmagon. If the PSA does not go down noticeably, uh, would that mean that I would be castration resistant? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, it would. And how long have you been on the Firmagon, Tony? One month. And so I'm getting my first uh, 
recheck of the PSA this week and the testosterone. Okay, so, and and what was your what was your PSA before you started the Firmagon? Zero point four seven. Okay, so you know it it may go down, but if it doesn't go down a huge amount, don't fret. If it's gone up, that might be something to be concerned about. But it can take a while to get the testosterone down. It doesn't. This is this is not a magic bullet. Um, you know, you you hope to see over a period of time the the testosterone, the uh, PSA to get down to 0 0.1 or less than 0 0.1. But it doesn't always happen and it can be slow. Does anybody have experience from after surgery seeing a decline in how quickly it's taken to get down to the nadir? Uh, it should be by 12 weeks, I think. I don't, you know. I'd... It took me closer to six months. Right. Yeah. It can take a while. Okay, that's good to know, so I don't have to worry about that. I, I, I wouldn't. And guys, there's a lot of you on here. I know maybe you just can't remember how long it took you to get down, but. It, it can take a while. I mean, I think in my own case, um, wow, I think it was about, I think it was about 45 day, 45 to 90 days after, um, I finished the, uh, after I finished the, AD, I started the ADT before the radiation therapy and the all of the different types of radiation therapy. And I think within about 45 days of finishing the the therapy, I was down to 0 0.1. But that's diff, that that was his initial treatment. So I'm glad I asked that question because it does bring a lot of clarity to it. And uh, and uh, I was concerned, thinking if it didn't go down, that it uh, you know, could be castration resistance, but I've got a lot of time now from what others have indicated. It takes uh, the timeline to. Yeah, get the it takes time. PSA down. Yeah, yeah. Some guys come down real quick. I mean, you know, the quick, they, they say that the quicker the you come down, the better the response. So, I mean, that it, it can be a factor. Um, and, and the guys that come down quickly may do better. Some guys don't come down so quickly and they still do fine. So okay. don't be much. too anxious about that one. All right. All right, guys. What? Yes. Tony, I had a recent PSMA scan, right? Yes. And the, the, the scan did not pick up anything. That was my first uh, PSMA scan. But at the time, it was the the PSA test was 4.7, and that was for like four days after I had the scan. So probably at the time of the scan, it was probably 0 0.45. But it didn't pick up anything with a Polarify. Yeah, good. Sorry, okay. go ahead. No, 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 no. Good question. Good, good question. Um, I think we're around done and we're only two minutes over. Has anybody else got any questions they'd like to ask before we close out tonight? Thank right. you, Rick. It's a pleasure, Good night, everyone. Good right. night to you all, and we'll be back next week with with Len in the chair. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.